Welcome back to Complex Analysis, everyone. So today we're gonna to talk about Cauchy's theorem. And when I was preparing for this video, the, the meme that came to mind was that meme that you have here on the right, which is taken from uh, Infinity War, where um, one of Thanos' henchmen is trying to get the time stone from Doctor Strange, and he has it hidden in the, um, I think it's called the Eye of Agamotto, which is like a necklace that's hanging um, well around his neck. And in any case, the henchman cannot retrieve it, and that's because Doctor Strange put a spell on it, and he tells the henchman it's a simple spell, but quite unbreakable. Now, why is that? Why did that come to mind in Cauchy's theorem? I'm not honestly really sure why, because Cauchy's theorem is actually at least the proof of it is not simple at all. It's something that you know you'll see in grad school, but definitely beyond the sco scope of this course. But um, I feel like it's kind of simple to state in a way after you know a certain thing. So in any case, the analogy is is not probably the best one, but it's the one that I, I thought of for some reason and got stuck in my head. In any case, let's go ahead and talk about Cauchy's theorem. So first, let's talk about some topology, though, and some topology that we'll need to actually state um, Cauchy's theorem. Uh, in any case, uh, suppose that gamma naught and gamma one are paths in a region G. Now your book says closed, but the actual definition of homotopy doesn't require them to be closed. You can actually have points. The only thing that is required though is that these paths have to start and end at the same place. They don't have to necessarily be closed though. So I actually think that's an error in your book there. So we're just gonna say, just replace this with smooth paths. And then keep in mind in the back of your heads, they're paths that have to start and end at the same place. Start slash end in the same place. Okay, so this is the picture I want you to think about, something like this. You can have closed curves, by the way, and that, that's and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but in, at least in terms of this definition, the paths don't have to be closed. So suppose gamma naught and gamma one are smooth paths that start and end at the same place, Again, they don't have to be closed. Sometimes they will be, but not necessarily. And let's let G be some region that the paths are living in, okay? Now let's suppose that both of our paths have parameterizations that start at time t equal to zero and end at time t equal to one. So in our definition, we're implicitly saying that gamma naught of t, I'm sorry, of zero equals gamma one of t. So they're starting at the same place. And we're also assuming that they end at the same place. Whoops, that should be a zero, that should be a one, that should be a one, boom. Okay, now this is what, where it's gonna get kind of crazy and I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna give you guys some pictures to sort of visualize this with, but in any case, we say that gamma naught is G homotopic to gamma one, and notice here, it is region specific, so you have to be really careful about your regions here. In any case, we say gamma naught is G homotopic to gamma one, if there exists a continuous function h from 0, 1 squared to g, such that for all st in 0, 1, we have the following three properties whole, okay? Now let's break this up because this is a, this is a, a lot to, to grasp here. But this is what we're saying here. This is what we're dealing with. So h is a two-variable function, okay? So the first variable, that's just the time parameter for our paths. And then the second parameter, I like to think about that as sort of like a transformation parameter. That's not how you spell transformation. There we go. Transformation parameter. Oh, that's why I wrote P. Okay. Because homotopies, and by the way, H here, this function here, the H is usually called a homotopy. Homotopies are functions on themselves or on their own, but they're, they're sort of functions that take functions to other functions. They're kind of meta in a way. They're functions that take functions to other functions. And we'll, we'll kind of explain that in a second. But in any case, h on its own, it's a two variable function that satisfies the, these three properties. So at s equal to zero, you're your first path. Okay, So that's what this first statement is saying. When you plug in s equal to zero, so our transformation parameter zero, then we get the first path that we're talking about, gamma naught. If you plug in s equal to one, then you get the second path. And then if you plug in any number in between, you're sort of staying at a, uh, you're still, you're, the paths that H is outputting is still starting and ending at the same place. So all paths in between um, start and end at the same place. So H really is sort of outputting for every S value a different path. And all these paths start 
slash end in the same place. Okay, so if there exists such a function taking gamma naught to gamma one, then we would say that gamma naught is G homotopic to gamma one. And we use this notation here, which should remind you if you've taken um, like a, a math proof course, this is kind of what we use for equivalence relations, which we'll actually get to in a little bit. But in any case, this is what a homotopy is. This is what homotopic means. So two paths are homotopic if there exists a continuous function, which we also call a homotopy, that takes one path to the other. And again, think about it as sort of like a, a transformation in a way. And here, let me give you some pictures so you can sort of actually get the, the gist of this. So here's three examples here. The one on the very left, this is what your book is, um, or the example your book gives you. And your book is basically saying that you can take a circle, and I think it was the unit circle. I don't really remember at this point. But anyway, your book is saying you can take a circle and uh, you can transform it into a square. So if you think, if you see all these lines here, this is what the homotopy is doing. And again, basically what a homotopy does, and let me erase those for a second. A homotopy is taking one path and it's, it's deforming it into the, another path. So if you think about this circle here, let's pretend like this is our gamma naught, okay? What the homotopy is doing in a continuous way, it's sort of like, think about a rubber band and you're stretching out the side so that it makes a square, okay? That's what the homotopy is doing, okay? And it's doing it in a continuous way. Whenever you have a homotopy, it has to be continuous. When you take one path and make it look like the other, you can't rip apart the path can't poke holes in it or anything like that. It has to be a continuous sort of stretching or shrinking motion, okay? And so that's what this picture is saying here. So the circle is homotopic to the square, okay? Because we can take the circle and we can stretch it into the square without ripping the circle or poking holes in it or anything like that, okay? Um, here's another example that's going to be important at some point because we're going to talk about what's called contractible paths. But here's a circle that's homotopic to a point. And this one, you actually get to see the homotopy H in action here. Okay, so what's happening here is we're starting with the circle. Okay, and we're sh continuously shrinking it down to a point. Okay, so hopefully you guys can take a second and kind of look at that. And again, that's what a homotopy is doing. A homotopy is a continuous function that's taking one path, in this case, a circle, and it's taking it to another path. And in this case, it's a point, okay? And this is actually a nice example because this is an example that shows closed paths, two closed paths that are, that are homotopic to each other, okay? But the function that's doing this, that's taking the circle and making it into the point, that's the homotopy H there. And again, it's continuous. It's, it's deforming the circle. In this case, we're just shrinking the circle in a very continuous way. We're not breaking, puncturing, anything like that. And then lastly over here, here's a general uh, two paths, uh, I would say a more general homotopy. So we have this first path up here. Okay, let's call this gamma naught. And then this path down here would be gamma one. And again, all we're doing is we're sort of taking the curve and we're sort of stretching it this way so that we get gamma one, okay? So again, two paths are homotopic if there exists this function that takes one to the other. Okay. Now this is a lot, and this is something that you would see in a topology course or in, in grad school even. You'll get a little bit more familiar with it if you go to grad school. Um, but what I want you guys to take out of this, because I'm never going to have you explicitly find a homotopy, because that's that might be a little bit difficult. But this is the picture I want you guys to have in your head, though. Okay. When we say that two, let's not write with the eraser. When we say that two paths are homotopic. Okay. First of all, the region is important. But what I want you guys to imagine is we say that they're homotopic if you can take one and think about this picture right here. We can take one path and sort of stretch it into the other path. Okay, so in this case we're stretching it this way. Okay, so that's what I want you guys to take away from this. Paths are homotopic if you can take one and continuously, meaning we're not puncturing it or shredding it or breaking it or anything, but if you can continuously deform one by stretching, okay, or maybe shrinking parts a little bit, um, into the other one, OK? 
okay? So think about this picture here, or this picture, this is good too. And if you like sort of like the freeze frame picture, the one that your book gives you is kind of nice too. But I kind of like these animations though because it really gives you the, like what's going on with H. And H again is just the function that's doing this process. H is the animation, okay? So at time t equal to zero, in the middle picture, you're the big circle. And then at time t equal to one, you're that point, okay? So that's homotopies in a very, very quick um, quick uh, crash course in them. All right, so a few facts in homotopy, and I actually think these are more fun facts because I don't know if we're going to use them too much. But in any case, um, again, like I mentioned earlier, we use the symbol tilde. So gamma naught is G homotopic to gamma 1. Um, again, the reason why we're using that is because actually homotopy is an equivalence relation on the set of closed paths in G. So for those of you, again, that have taken a, a proof-based course where you talk about equivalence relations and equivalence classes and all that good stuff, well, homotopy actually is an equivalence relation. So it takes the set of closed paths in G and partitions them into equivalence classes. So something kind of cool. I don't know if we're going to use that too much, but it's, a, again, I think it's kind of a little nice little fun fact and a nod to uh, your proof-based math course. Um, second, which we may use here and there, homotopy is invariant under reparameterizations. Now what I mean by that is, let's suppose that we have a path. And let's say this is gamma 1. And again, let's say we have another path, gamma 3. Okay, So hopefully by looking at these two paths, and let's say that our region is this right here, this is G, hopefully you guys can again you see that we could take gamma 1 and we can deform it so that we get gamma 3 there. We just have to kind of bend it a little bit, right? Pull it down this way. Okay? So these are definitely G homotopic in this case. Okay? Um, so what the second fact is saying is that, well, remember for any path, in particular gamma 1, remember we have infinitely many ways of, re of parameterizing it, right? There's infinitely many parameter or parametric functions that will give you that same path, right? So what this is saying here is that if you have two different parameterizations for the same path, okay, both of them are still going to be homotopic to gamma 3. Okay, so if, let's say this path here, gamma 1, can be written as two different functions, let's call it, I don't know, gamma 1, 1, gamma 2, 1, something like that. So maybe this function is like, I don't know, w plus e to the 4it, and maybe this one is, I don't know, something else, something, okay? But in any case, let's pretend like we have a path that has two different parameterizations. Well, if one of these parameterizations gives you or leads you to a homotopy to this path, gamma 3, then the other parameterization would as well. So in a sense, it doesn't matter what parameterization you have of a path. If two paths are homotopic, it doesn't matter what parameterization you have for each path. So kind of like a nice little like um, escape card or get out of jail free card. It doesn't matter what parameterization we use. If we can prove that two paths are homotopic, well, it would, it would be true for any parameterizations we have of them. All right. So now we can actually state that simple but quite unbreakable theorem, Cauchy's theorem. So Cauchy's theorem says the following. So suppose we have a region G. Okay, so here's G. And let's suppose we have a function that's holomorphic in G. And let's suppose that we have two paths that are homotopic to each other. So let's say that this is gamma naught. Let's say this is gamma 1. And again, hopefully you guys can visualize they are definitely G homotopic because we can take gamma naught and again stretch it to or deform it into gamma 1 just by pulling. Okay, So in any case, if we have this setup, we have two paths that are homotopic, we have a function that's holomorphic, then Cauchy's theorem actually says if you integrate your function over these paths, you actually get the same value, which is kind of insane. So as long as your paths are homotopic, your integral is going to end up the same. Okay, So if gamma naught is g homotopic to gamma 1, then integrals calculate or yield the same calculation. 
yield, same calculation. Which is kind of insane, because you're integrating over different sets of complex numbers, right? If you look at in our picture here, gamma naught, you're integrating over these complex numbers. Gamma 1, you're integrating over these complex numbers. But because they're homotopic, meaning you can deform one path into the other, so essentially you can make these complex numbers into these other complex numbers, the integral is going to give you the same thing at the end of the day. Okay, it's kind of mind blown. That's kind of awesome. And uh, another thing I want to say, just as a sort of little side note, what this means is whenever you're going to compute an integral, make sure you're computing it over the sort of the simplest path that you can take in terms of integration, which we'll kind of get to in an example in a second. But um, okay. Actually, the example we're going to talk about is right now. So consider f of z equal to 1 over z. And let's let gamma be the square whose vertices are plus or minus 3, plus or minus 3i. So this is kind of what we were talking about in the homotopy pictures. But we have a square. So let's say this is 3. Let's say this is 3i. This is minus 3. This is minus 3i. Let's pretend like this is a perfect square, everyone. Um, and let's suppose that we wanted to compute the integral of f over this square here. Okay. Now this would kind of be a pain because if we wanted to do this, we'd actually have to break up the square. And let's suppose that, by the way, we're going this way, counterclockwise like we always do. Um, if we wanted to compute this integral, we'd actually have to break it up into four different pieces. We'd have to integrate along this line. Then we'd have to integrate along this line. Then we'd have to integrate along this line. And then we'd have to integrate along this line. So we'd have to compute at the end of the day four different integrals just to compute this one bigger integral. Okay, But Cauchy's theorem actually gives us a, 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 um, a way out of this, this horrible madness. And by the way, I do. If you wanna, if you want good practice, actually try integrating that over that. That's gonna be. You're gonna see that it's a pain, and you'll probably appreciate Cauchy's theorem a little bit more. But Cauchy's theorem says, well, um, if we can find an easier or a better parameter or a, a, another path that this is homotopic to, then we can use that to calculate this integral. Okay. So like your book says, well, this circ this uh, square is actually homotopic to the unit circle. Okay, again, and the way we can see that is, well, you can always take this square and shrink it this way. Okay. So in any case, in order to compute this um, integral, instead of integrating the square, we can actually integrate, let's call it gamma tilde. We can actually in integrate over the unit circle instead, which we like. Okay, because if we're dealing with the unit circle, remember we have that exercise that I've been quoting and talking about, I think, in the last three or four videos. If we integrate over the unit circle, then we know that this is 2 pi i, and we're good to go. We don't even have to do anything anymore. Done. By that great exercise. Okay. So Cauchy's theorem, in this case, gave us a really, really nice way out. Instead of having to integrate over the square, well, we can integrate over the circle because we know that the square is homotopic to the circle, at least in, in C less this point here, in this region here where our function is continuous at. Um, and that gave us a, and that's a, a lot faster, right? Because we know this result already. Boom, we're done. All right, so like I said earlier, the proof of Cauchy's theorem is well beyond the, the scope of this, this course. Um, if you go to grad school, you for sure will see it. Well, if you take a complex analysis course. Um, and I think your book, if I remember correctly, your book does give a proof where I think they assume certain things. But in any case, we're just going to treat Cauchy's theorem as true. OK. Um, so we're going to close up this section with um, contractibility and sort of a nice little um, corollary to Cauchy's theorem. So let G be a region. And let's let gamma be a closed path that's G homotopic to a point. Okay. So if you have a closed path that's G homotopic to a point, then we say that G is our gamma is G contractible. And we write gamma is homotopic to 0. Okay, now we're not saying zero is the origin or anything like that. We just mean zero is it's just a point. Okay, and, and our notation for that is just zero. Okay. 
So again, here's that picture that I showed you earlier. Here's a circle that is contractible to, a, or that is homotopic to a point. And again, just imagine taking like a rubber band and sort of shrinking it all the way till it's a little point. Okay, and we can do that continuously without ripping the rubber band or anything like that. Now, let me just give you an example of why the region's so, um, so important. So let's say we have C here, and let's say that I get rid of this point here. So let's say we have a hole here. So let's say G is this, this right here, okay? So um, if I took a circle that has this point inside of it, let's say this one, this circle would not be homotopic to a point because there's no way you can continuously shrink this without having to somehow break your circle and get it around this hole there, okay? So that's why you have to be really, really careful about your regions. Circles are not necessarily contractible to a point. It depends on what region you're talking about. So for instance, if we're talking about G is this set with this hole here that's missing, so if we had a circle with the hole inside the circle, then that would not be homotopic to a point because we'd actually have to break or tear our circle at some point so that we can sort of sneak it around this thing, around that hole there, okay? which we can't do with homotopy. Remember, homotopies have to be a continuous process. So just be very aware, not all circles are G homotopic to points. It depends on what your region G is. For instance, let's say, let me give you another circle that would be contractible. So let's say, and let's not use blue since this whole thing is blue. So let's say this was our circle in G. Okay, maybe green is not as good as I thought it would be. There we go. So let's say that's our circle. So since the hole is outside the circle, we could actually shrink this continuously to a point. So that would be contractible. That would be a, a closed path that is contractible. However, our red path here would not be contractible because again, since the circle is around the hole, there's no way we can actually shrink it to a point without somehow breaking our circle to get around that hole. So just be very, very careful. I know I feel like your book kind of almost makes it seem just, I mean, it doesn't make it seem, but it at a, if you're not careful about your regions, it could be, um, it could seem like all circles are homotopic to a point, but it's not necessarily true. It is region specific. So just be careful. All right, so an immediate consequence um, of Cauchy's theorem is the following. So suppose we have a region G, F is holomorphic, and let's suppose that gamma is a piecewise smooth curve that is contractible or homotopic to a point. Then if you integrate your function, you actually get zero. Okay. Now this should make sense because if your path is contractible, meaning it's the same as a point, okay, well what happens in calculus when you integrate over a point, right? If you integrate, let's say, x squared from 1 to 1 over a single point, what do you get? You're going to get 0. It's the same idea in complex analysis. If you integrate over a path that can be shrunk down to a point continuously, then if you integrate over it, you're going to get 0. Right, so that's what this consequence is saying there. Now again, just to stress, it is region specific, so be careful about your regions. Okay? Don't be quick to say, oh, it's a closed path, so it's automatically contractible. No, no, no. Be very careful about what your region is and, what, what, um, and your function too, because the function has to be holomorphic in that region, so you have to be a little bit careful. It's kind of like this balance game. You have to balance out your path with your functions domain, so to speak. All right, so let's look at an example. So consider f of z equal to 1 over z squared and gamma of t equal to 5 plus 2 e to the i t. So if we look at this function, and let me go not to green, let's go back to red. Um, f of z here is holomorphic, not on all of c, morphic, on c less 0, right? Because if we plug in 0, we Thanos snap, right? Okay, so f of z is holomorphic on c less 0. And if we draw our path gamma, okay, gamma, again, this is going to be a circle, radius, a uh, circle centered at 5 with radius 2 
and notice that we're going one full rotation, 0 to 2 pi. So let's go ahead and draw that. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's our center. We have radius 2. So if that's 5, 1, 7. So we start here at 0, and then we go all the way around like this. Okay. And notice that this circle, if we consider our region G to be C less 0, so let's take our origin here. I'm going to put a little hole here. Okay. So this circle in G equal to C less 0 is actually contractible to a point. Okay. So what Cauchy's theorem tells us, or at least the corollary to Cauchy's theorem, is we know automatically, since this circle is contractible in this G, okay, in this region, we know right away that the integral of f over our path here is automatically 0. And we don't even have to do any calculations. Now, if you wanted to, you could try to plug that in and then actually use the definition. But I mean, this is a whole lot easier, right? So kind of what I, what I recommend from this point on, whenever you're doing integrals, try to imagine your region and then imagine the sort of the domain or the, the area of holomorphicity of your, your function f. Okay. And you kind of have to balance those two. All right, so the last corollary we're, we're going to talk about, and then we'll get into a little bit of algebra. If f is entire, remember, entire just means that you're differentiable at every complex number, and gamma is a piecewise smooth closed path, then you know that the integral of f over gamma is automatically 0. Now, the reason for this is if you're entire, that means that g is all of c. Okay, so we don't have any holes or anything like that like we did in the last example. So if you take any closed path, okay, you can always shrink it down to a point because there's no holes you have to get around. So any closed path in all of C will always be contractible. So then we know that this function will integrate to 0 over that path. Kind of cool. And by kind, I mean really cool. So a couple of notes on the theorems and corollaries. Um, so these results are not just good for showing that integrals are 0. And we're going to see an example in a second that, that gets at that. Um, but I, I know a lot of the results have been saying, oh, this integral is 0 if these conditions are met. This integral is 0 if these conditions are met. Oh, this integral equals that integral. I don't want you thinking that all of complex analysis is just you know showing that certain integrals are 0. No, there, but uh, sometimes that's true. But what I would say, or at least more, more importantly, what they allow us to do is to simplify certain integrals. And that's what I'm going to show you in this next example. So I know a lot of them have been saying, oh, the integrals are 0. Yeah, that, that is helpful, but usually they help us simplify other more complex integrals. OK, so let's see um, an example where these results are going to help us simplify a, a, a sort of complex integral. So let's consider the integral over gamma, where gamma is the unit circle, oriented counterclockwise. And we're integrating the function 1 over z squared minus 2z. So something with a little bit more bite to it than we're usually dealing with. Um, so now the first thing we're going to do is sort of simplify our function a little bit. And then we're actually going to steal some stuff from calc 2. Okay? So notice I can factor a z from the bottom, right? So our function will become z times z minus 2. Okay. And so if you remember back from Calc 2, this is a rational expression, right? And partial fraction decomposition allows us to simplify or break up sort of complex rational expressions. So that's actually what we're going to do here. We're going to sort of take our cues from Calc 2 a little bit. So let's do a little bit of a, a recall, because this is something that you'll probably see at some point again. Um, how do you actually decompose this? So partial fraction decomposition, again, is a way of taking a rational expression like this and breaking it up into smaller chunks. So partial fraction decomposition would say that this will break up into a over z plus b over z minus 2. And notice we just have the linear factors here that are becoming the denominators there. Okay. Um, so our job, though, is, well, what the heck is a and b, though? So that's what partial fraction decomposition doesn't tell us. And that's where we have to do a little bit of algebra. So there's a couple ways to solve for a and b. Uh, we're going to do it this way, sort of the plug and chug method, which will make sense in a little bit. 
First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by z times z minus 2. Okay? And the reason why I'm doing this is I want to clear the denominator so we don't have fractions anymore. So if I do this, notice our equation is going to become 1 is equal to a times z minus 2 plus b times z. Okay. Let me erase this because we're going to use this in a second. OK. So now that we have this, again, this is where there's a couple of ways to solve for A and B. We're going to do the plug and chug method. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick smart values of z that's going to sort of destroy or get rid of one of the variables. So if we plug in, for instance, z is equal to 2, notice our equation is going to become 1 is equal to a times 0. So a is going to go away, plus 2b. And so now solving for b, we get that b is equal to 1 half. Okay, so if I go up to my expression up here, I'm going to update it. So b is equal to 1 half, so I'm going to write it like this. 1 half times 1 over z minus 2. Now you might be like, why did I put the 1 half out there? That's just going to be nice when we start to integrate this thing. So this is purely a, a cosmetic reason. OK, um, so that was one smart choice is z. Let's go ahead and plug in another smart choice. So another smart choice would be 0, because if we plug in 0, b is going to go away. So we get, if we plug in 0, 1 is equal to a times minus 2 plus b times 0. So b goes away. And now we have solving for a. a is equal to minus 1 half. Okay, so plugging this into our equation, we're going to get that this first chunk here becomes minus 1 half times 1 over z. OK, so now let's take that information and let's substitute that into our integral. All right, so the integral over gamma of uh, dz, uh, z times z minus 2, becomes the integral, okay, using our partial fraction decomposition, 1 half minus 1 half times 1 over z plus 1 half times 1 over z minus 2 dz. Okay. And now using properties of integrals, remember an integral always distributes uh, uh, over a sum, and we can also pull constants out. We can rewrite this as minus 1 half times the integral over gamma 1 over z dz plus 1 half integral over gamma 1 over z minus 2 dz. Okay. So what we've effectively done uh, by sort of taking our cues from calc 2 is we've taken this more complex integral and we've broken it up into two simpler integrals. And now we can start to use our results and, and um, uh, that, that exercise that I keep talking about or talking up. Okay, so let's go ahead and examine these integrals one by one. So let's start with this one. So now our function is 1 over z minus 2. Okay, now this is a holomorphic function on c less 2, right? Because the only number I can't plug into this because we'll be Thanos snapping is 2, right? So it's holomorphic on c less 2. And if we think about the unit circle, okay, here's 2, which I'm going to put a hole there because we can't allow it for this function. And the unit circle looks like this, okay? So in c less 2, in this region, the unit circle is actually contractible. It's homotopic to a point. So what does our result say? That our result says right off the bat that this is 0. Boom. So we've sort of axed part of this integral. Okay. Now, if we look at the integral on the left here, that's actually not as straightforward because if we think about this function 1 over z, well, that's holomorphic on c less 0, okay, less the origin. And unfortunately, if we think about our unit circle, the origin is right smack dab in the middle of it, right? So what that says is that the unit circle is not contractible. Okay, we can't actually contract it because of this hole. We'd have to break it or do something that's not continuous. Okay? However, remember we have that nice exercise that tells us exactly what this integral is equal to. This integral is equal to just 2 pi i. So that's from exercise 4.4. Okay? And so Simplifying a little bit more, the twos cancel out, and we get, in the end, minus pi i. So again, I just want to reiterate these theorems. I know a lot of them are saying that, oh, this integral is going to be 0. But there's a lot of conditions that have to be met, right? Your function has to be holomorphic on a region where that path is contractible. So if we, again, look at the integral on the left here, it wasn't 0 because, unfortunately, the unit circle 
won't be contractible because of that hole there. Okay, we would have to somehow break the unit circle, which would break continuity in order to make it contractible or contract it to a point. Okay, so again, a lot of these theorems are saying, oh, these certain integrals are zero, but there's conditions that have to be met. So you have to be really careful about your region and what function you're considering. But if you can sort of analyze your region and analyze your function enough, it could lead to very, very simple integrals like this one. This one was equal to zero. Okay. But for things like the left integral, we're going to have to use like exercises like 4.4 to say, oh, that's 2 pi i. Or maybe we're going to have to use definition of the, of the integral. In any case, again, hopefully this exemplifies these results really help us break down more complex integrals. They're not just for saying, oh, this integral is 0.